Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the EEA's Facebook Live interview on air pollution and its health impacts. So we're at the Environment, uh, European Environment Agency. My name is Antti Kartinen, and I'm here with my colleague, Katrin Gunsleben. Good morning. I think we'll just get started by Katrin telling us about a little bit about what you do uh, in your team at the EEA. Yeah, super. So my team works on air pollution, environment and health. So what that means is in terms of air quality, um, we we pull together the latest information on air quality across Europe. Um, and we then translate that information into health impacts. So we can understand what the impact of air quality is on people's health across Europe. And the way that we do that is we work with 41 countries across Europe. Um, and in those countries, there's more than 4,000 monitoring stations all monitoring the quality of air, so testing for key air pollutants. Um, they monitor the concentrations of those air pollutants in air, and then they report data to us. And they actually report data um, on an hourly basis. So mm -hmm. we have up-to-date, real-time data. Yeah. And in terms of some of the key air pollutants that we're looking at, mm -hmm. we're talking about fine particulate matter, which mm -hmm. has the biggest impacts on health. Yep. We're talking about coarse particulate matter, which are slightly larger particles. That's the what they call PM10. PM10, right? yeah. yeah. We're talking about nitrogen dioxide mm -hmm. and we're talking about ozone. So right. those are the really important yeah. air pollutants. And we'll go into those pollutants in just a moment, but you also uh, work on noise and, and some other uh, environment and health related issues. Can you tell just briefly a, a bit about that line of work as well? Certainly, yes. So we also work, as you mentioned, on environmental noise. Mm -hmm. So we look at sources of noise, um, predominantly from transport, so from road transport, from rail and from aeroplanes. And we look at how that impacts on people's health. Yep. It's really an urban issue. Yeah. So it's really linked to transport, particularly heavy road transport in urban areas, but there's also some impacts around airports from aircraft noise. And this is also an important uh, driver of ill health and can really impact, for example, on children's yeah. concentration in schools. Yeah. We also work on chemicals. Yeah. So we look at um, human exposure to chemicals across mm -hmm. Europe. Um, which is also a really important issue. There's more than 100,000 chemicals on the market in products. Um, and we assess um, what those risks are and how it impacts on health. Um, and finally, we do also look at the health impacts of climate change. Um, so, for example, yeah. the impacts of flooding, the impacts of extreme um, heat, um, and the impacts on communities um, where they've seen um, extreme weather events. Yeah. And now back to air pollution, because mm -hmm. that's what we say is the, is the, is the greatest environmental uh, uh, health risk to Europeans and also, also globally. And uh, uh, what I read in the news, actually the first piece of news what I read this morning, uh, was uh, about our assessment on the health impacts of air pollution in, in 2019 in Europe. Uh, and it said that more, more than 300,000 Europeans died because of uh, pollution uh, related to fine particulate matter uh, in that year. Can you tell us about, about those figures and, and how we how we made that assessment? Certainly. So you're right. It is the number one risk to health um, from the environment in yeah. Europe. So it's really a critical issue. Um, what we do, as I said, is we have the latest information on air quality across Europe. And we're able to combine that information with information on the population density. So the demographics of different communities, so the age demographics. Mm -hmm. And then we have information from our colleagues at the World Health Organization on the relationship between a certain concentration of air pollution and health impacts. Mm -hmm. And using those three pieces of information, we're able to make robust assessments of how air pollution impacts health. The latest uh, data that we have that's really official data validated by the countries is from 2019. And as you said, um, we saw that in 2019, there were over 300,000 premature deaths linked mm -hmm. to air pollution. So that means people are dying earlier than they otherwise would, earlier than the average life expectancy. Yeah. 
And and this year actually we we, we put a special focus on on uh, on how that those deaths actually could have been prevented if we had better air quality in in Europe. So we look at if the the uh, the, the air pollution levels, instead of being what they were in 2019, we would have reached some of the, the recommended levels by the, for the World Health Organization. And that give, gave us also some, some estimates about where we could be. Uh, yeah, so let me just unpack that a bit. So yeah. um, the World Health Organization um, produces recommendations mm -hmm. for the ideal quality that air should have in order to avoid any impacts on health. And this year, they just updated their what we call global air quality guidelines. Mm -hmm. These were long awaited. They are based on the latest science um, and they are put together by top scientists and epidemiologists who have the best understanding of the relationship between air pollution and health impacts. Yeah. And what they came up with, particularly for fine particulate matter, mm -hmm. was that the health impacts of air pollution were worse than we had previously thought. Yeah. And as a result, they've lowered the threshold um, yeah. to a really quite um, ambitious level um, of five micrograms per meter cube. Yeah. Just for comparison, the EU standard for fine particulate matter is mm -hmm. 25 micrograms. So you can see there's quite a difference there. Yeah. Yeah. So what we wanted to do was to understand, okay, if we were able to achieve that level of mm -hmm. air quality across mm -hmm. Europe, how many premature deaths would we save? Yeah. Um, and we saw that we would save uh, more than 70% of premature deaths if mm -hmm. we were able to bring it down on 2005 numbers. Yeah. Um, so there, was, there would be a significant improvement. Yeah. Um, and... What's exciting now is that we're having a conversation in Europe about the targets that we have in EU legislation mm -hmm. and whether we can now bring those closer to the latest WHO recommendations yeah. um, and how we might go about doing that. Right. So that in the long run we could achieve better equality and then we would uh, have basically better health for citizens, we would be more productive and, and uh, yes, people would live longer essentially, that's what it means. Yeah, exactly, because when you have ill health related to air pollution, of course, um, it's not just about the individual um, staying home and being ill, it's mm. also about lost pro productivity, they're not able to go to work. Yeah. <clears throat> you also have healthcare costs. Many of the illnesses associated, particularly with fine particulate matter, are really serious. Mm -hmm. You know, we're talking about cardiovascular disease. We're talking about lung cancer. Seventeen mm -hmm. percent of lung cancers are driven by exposure to air pollution. These mm -hmm. are the main diseases that drive death in yeah. Europe. Yeah. Um, so the costs um, in terms yeah. of human life, but also in terms of healthcare, in terms of lost productivity, are really significant. Yeah. And then let's go back to the fine particulate matter because basically we're talking about very fine dust, little pieces, that, and that's part of the problem. They are so small, uh, like 2.5 micrometers, uh, uh, something like that, and then they go very deep into our lungs and, and, and they don't come out, and that's, that's what causes the... the yeah, exactly. Dust. So 2.5 micrograms, really tiny little pieces of dust, yeah. as you say. And when we inhale them, they, could, they go into our lungs and they penetrate right into our lungs and they cross the barrier between the lungs and the blood and enter the blood system. Okay. And then they circulate in the blood and they can affect every organ in the body. So yeah. um, the brain, the reproductive system, the heart, the lungs. Um, but they can also, in a pregnant woman, cross the placenta and enter into the fetus and affect the fetus. And we yeah. have clear evidence, robust evidence of this. Yeah. Um, so it's really a, um, an important pollutant that we, we need to focus on. Yeah. And if we stay on that fine particulate matter, w where does it come from? What are the sources of fine particulate matter? Uh, so um, in terms of the sources, of course, we have the fossil fuel industry. So mm -hmm. the burning of fossil fuels, in particular coal, and we see some of the highest concentrations of particulate matter um, in Eastern Europe, where there's still a dependency on coal. Um, there's also an association with um, burning what we call biomass, which um, can be wood, for example, or yeah. other um, waste that people burn in their houses yeah. um, in order to heat their houses in the cold yeah. winters. Yeah. 
um, and that will also admit fine particulate matter. And there, there's a link with, with poverty, right? Yeah. Because individuals who can't afford cleaner fuels yeah. <clears throat> are depending upon these low quality fuels to keep warm. Yeah. And this is especially problematic in cities where you, if you, if you, have, a, you have a lot of people, and uh, you have a lot of people in a, in a, in a small area uh, where uh, if you don't have uh, domestic uh, um, sort of distribution heating systems, then if you burn wood or, or, or litter or something like that at your home, then, then the pollution spreads in that area. And, and that's, that's what causes the problems. Exactly, yes. So it's really an issue in urban areas where, as you say, you mm -hmm. have this high concentration of people Mm -hmm. um, and often also more elderly populations and young populations of people, children and the elderly are the most vulnerable. And then you have these activities, um, for example, combustion of poor quality fuels in the home where people are heating. Mm -hmm. And so you have this <clears throat> coincidence of high populations and poor air quality. Right. I would also mention two other sources that are important. Yeah. Um, one is transport emissions, mm -hmm. um, where we see transport, particularly road transport. Mm -hmm. So again, the internal combustion engine mm -hmm. relying also on... Also in cities. In cities, yes. Yeah. Um, leading to emissions of fine particulate matter and then high concentrations. Mm -hmm. um, and we also see a contribution to particulate matter from agriculture. Right. So perhaps something that's less well known, um, <clears throat> when farmers spread manure on the fields, yeah. it leads to the release of a gas called ammonia. Mm -hmm. And ammonia actually then reacts in air with other gases to produce particulate matter. Right. And thereby makes a contribution to particulate matter in air. Right. And this is one of the sources that's received less attention over the last 30 years. Yeah. Um, and so it's an area where I think we still have some work ahead of us to control emissions. Right. Thanks for that. Very uh, exciting stuff. A lot of, uh, <laughs> sort of it's the chemistry in the air and the sources and how it impacts our health. Um, I just want to remind our viewers at this point that uh, if you want to ask uh, questions from Catherine, um, just post them in the comments section uh, below the, the, uh, the video and uh, we'll, we'll uh, try to answer them the best we can. Um, you mentioned uh, the uh, EU legal limits uh, for air quality and uh, you also mentioned that uh, of course we have still air quality problems obviously in Europe uh, because we have these health impacts but air quality has also been improving in Europe, if, mm -hmm. if you look at it historically. Mm -hmm. uh, but can you say something about that development and, and where are we now compared to um, years ago? Certainly. So you're very right. Air quality has improved significantly um, over the last uh, three decades in Europe. And that, ha that improvement has been driven by policies to improve air. Yeah. So policies to reduce emissions. And that's translated into reductions in premature deaths. So implementing policies to reduce air pollution saves lives. In fact, if we look back to 2005 um, and we compare the number of premature deaths with 2019, we mm -hmm. see a 33% reduction. Right. Um, so that's really a significant fall yeah. in the health impact. So we were somewhere at 450,000 in, in 2005 and now we're sort of... Yeah, and now we've That's brought the, it down. In the EU. In yeah. the EU 27, yeah, yeah, yeah. so yeah. minus the UK now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we really have had an important impact, you mm -hmm. know, and um, the point is that we should not stop there. We can continue to improve and go further. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, there are trade offs, right? We have yeah. to talk about those trade offs. You know, we have to make decisions about our transport modes mm -hmm. um, and shifting away from mm -hmm. the um, vehicles based on internal combustion engines. Yeah. Um, we have to make choices about our fossil fuels. We have mm -hmm. to address some of these issues mm -hmm. around social equity mm -hmm. where people can't afford clean fuels. Yeah. Um, we have to look at the agricultural sector, you mm -hmm. know, where we see emissions predominantly linked to livestock. So there's questions yeah. there around, you know, the drive for meat consumption and whether yeah. we should look at our diets yeah. and change those, yeah. as well as changing the technical practices in the industry. Yeah. But a lot of the things that you mentioned now are actually now uh, the, the COP26 in, in Glasgow just ended. These are the same things, by and large, that we talk about when we, when we talk about addressing uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So we talk about transport, we talk about uh, fossil fuels, we talk about agriculture, uh, there must be some 
co-benefit serves, like if you address the air pollutants, we also reduce greenhouse gas emissions. That's, that's right, right? Exactly. So there are real synergies um, between the priorities to reduce the mitigation of greenhouse gases mm -hmm. and um, actions to reduce emissions of key air pollutants. Um, and those synergies should should really be uh, maximized in the policy approach. Yeah. Um, so, for example, if you look at fossil fuels, it's very clear, right? It's uh, the key source of emissions of carbon dioxide. It's mm -hmm. also a key source of emissions of fine particulate matter. And if you look at the transport sector, again, we see emissions both of fine particulate matter and nitrogen oxides. Yeah. And we see emissions of carbon dioxide um, from transport so that shift again could yield yeah. so co there, if we go towards more active mobility walking cycling uh, public transport electric vehicles to some extent um, that that will help both air quality in cities but it also uh, reduce our greenhouse gas emissions exactly exactly yeah. but also in the agricultural sector um, when I talked about ammonia emissions from the manure from livestock, it's not just ammonia, it's also methane. Methane mm -hmm. is a very powerful greenhouse gas, uh, more powerful than carbon dioxide. Yep. Um, so if we look at, again, our meat consumption patterns and the management of livestock and manure in the agricultural sector, mm -hmm. there's also work to be done there that yes. could yield co-benefits. The one area where there's a tension is um, biomass. And so when it comes to um, using cleaner fuels in terms of mitigating greenhouse gases, there's been some push towards um, biomass. But for air pollutants, biomass do continue to contribute emissions of fine particulate matter, the most dangerous air pollutant. So there, there's a, there's a real tension across those agendas. But for the majority of areas, we see these really important and powerful synergies. Right. Um, I'm just looking at the uh, questions that we are receiving and I can see at least one question on Facebook. This is from Aliki uh, Kaltsido, I believe in Greece, um, who mentions a court decision um, of facing the Greece facing court for breaching the limits for PM10 in uh, so uh, particulate matter in, uh, in, in, in Greece uh, for the past 15 years. Um, and uh, the commission, he says that the commission concludes that the efforts by the Greek authorities have been to date insufficient. Um, she's asking if the EEA can help the commission to act earlier on these uh, problems. And, 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 and maybe this is the opportunity to tell a bit about what our role is, is with regard to the EU limits and the Commission's role and, and what type what, what, what the EEA is doing to, to uh, well to improve air quality but also keeping in citizens informed and, mm. and, and, and how that, uh, that work is, is picked up. Certainly. So thank you for the question. Um, and we are aware of course that there are issues with air quality in Greece and particularly in Athens. Um, and of course, I mean, we are, our heart goes out to you with the forest fires that you experienced this summer, which only exacerbated air quality issues. Mm -hmm. um, the role of the EEA, the European Environment Agency, is that we collect the air quality data from across Europe, from our member countries. Um, that data is reported to us by the official authorities in the country. So mm -hmm. the Greek authorities will report their data to us. We then pull that data together and we undertake assessments um, where we compare the air quality with the EU standards that are in place for the different pollutants. And we also make comparisons with the WHO recommendations. And we then estimate health impacts. Mm -hmm. We supply that information to the European Commission. The European Commission has the legal authority to take action against the country and indeed they are responsible for checking compliance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we don't do the compliance assessment ourselves, rather that is the, the role of our colleagues at the European Commission. So I think in terms of timeliness, um, the assessment of compliance is made against official data. Yeah. 
Um, so the latest official data that we have is for 2019. Yeah. Um, because the year has to come to a full close before yeah. it can be submitted, we have now just received the data for 2020. Yeah. So we are a little bit behind on yeah. that. But we do have some tools available to keep citizens informed about their air quality today, mm -hmm. which we hope that really helps to build understanding. So, for example, we have what we call the European Air Quality Index. This is an online tool, a map where you can go and you can identify the nearest air quality monitoring station to where you live. Um, and you can click on a little dot and you can then check the air quality where you live for a range of pollutants yeah. um, with one single um, index indicating the impacts directly on your health. Yeah. So if it's if it's if the air quality today is, is good or bad or, or moderate, and, and it's kind of it shows hourly data basically almost right now. Uh, exactly. So we use um, the real time data for that tool, mm -hmm. so it's really up to date, and it also has a forecast using satellite data. So you can yeah. also look into the future, yeah. and you can, for example, look at what the air quality was like over the past year where you live. Because in fact, it's really long-term air quality that has yeah. the most important impact on health. Right. So that's one tool. We also have what we call the European um, City Air Viewer, mm -hmm. which um, gives an overview of long-term air quality for more than 300 cities across Europe. So what you can do is you can go in and you can look at the air quality in your city and you can compare it to other cities mm -hmm. to see how your local authority is doing. Yeah. Um, and it also ranks the cities, which yeah. is quite controversial. Yeah. Um, but you can see which city in Europe has the best air quality. Yeah. I believe it was Umia, a city in northern Sweden. Yeah. Um, and you can see which cities have the worst air quality. Yeah, and uh, I think this is this is prompting citizens and, and uh, NGOs and, and of course the media to, to to look at what the situation is where they live and, and asking their uh, local police politicians and other authorities to, to to take action to improve air quality. Uh, exactly, and what's exciting right now is that the European Commission has um, opened a review of the air quality directives, which is right. the legislation on air quality in Europe. Um, and they are explicitly looking at the standards at European level for air quality and looking at the latest WHO guidelines. We mentioned earlier that they're considerably uh, stricter. Yeah. Um, so the values are lower because yeah. they're health based. Um, and there's a process in place to look at the EU standards and to align them more closely with those WHO standards, so to bring them down. And so there's going to be a political discussion about this in yeah. Europe over the coming couple of years. And so there's an opportunity there for citizens to reach out to their local MEP, Member of European Parliament, mm -hmm. and lobby them and say, I, as a citizen of Athens, want cleaner air. You need to push for this on my behalf yeah. in the European policy process. Exactly. More questions on Facebook. Um, you mentioned ammonia from agriculture uh, impacting earlier. Uh, what can be done there? Um, there's another maybe related question from uh, Marius uh, asking what measures should cities take to improve air pollution even more, especially in city centers where many cars and trucks still r drive around? Okay, so on ammonia um, emissions from agriculture, um, the source of the emissions is really the spreading of um, manure on yeah. agricultural land, which is important for soil quality. So it's a yeah. way of adding fertilizer to land. And there are different techniques that um, farmers can use so they can inject the manure into the soil rather than spraying it in the air. And yeah. these kind of techniques can really reduce the amount of emissions of ammonia. ammonia. How much is blown in the air and then dispersed to the surrounding areas? Is that kind of hard? Or? Exactly. Yeah. So if, if they spray it yeah. on the on the soil, then you have much higher levels of emissions exactly. than if you yeah. inject it into the yeah, soil. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and there's also issues to do with how manure is stored, right? Whether or not it's covered and whether emissions from storage are controlled. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there's the potential to reduce emissions. However, if one really needs to go to the source of the emissions, then ultimately it's to do with the number of livestock that we have. Um, right in Europe, yeah. and this raises the much broader question of meat consumption. Mm -hmm. And you know the pattern we've seen across Europe 
for people to increasingly eat more meat, the demand for low-cost meat, industrial production of meat, um, and questions about you know, whether we should shift towards um, diets that contain less or no meat. Yeah, and that would probably, I mean, it would be better for our health. Uh, it would be, uh, there would be fewer greenhouse gas emissions as well. So again, we have this link between the... Uh, exactly, the we have this very strong link also in terms of yielding benefits um, for greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah. But it's not straightforward, of course. We have large numbers of people employed in the yep. farming industry, in the agricultural industry industry we have cultural issues around agriculture yeah. um, we have people's choices and norms it's a free society so there are lots of really tricky questions about that yeah. that need to be explored absolutely and then the second then question the second was, was about uh, cities in in particular uh, and uh, referring to uh, uh, cars and trucks but also other issues in in, in urban areas where we see the, the the biggest health impacts also because about three in four uh, Europeans actually live in cities, so that's where the people are. But that's also where we have the worst air quality. Yeah. So um, certainly road transport is the principal source of air pollution um, in cities. Apart from ozone, it's a slightly different case. Um, and there are different approaches that cities can take. Um, you can have, if you maintain the level of road transport, you can put um, speed limits in place. And if vehicles drive at a lower speed, then the emissions are lower, particularly if you can eliminate some of the stopping and starting and get a smoother flow of traffic. Yeah. You can then take more, perhaps more radical approaches where you um, can... Where you can create... <laughs> This is the beauty of live interviews. We have uh, some office stuff going on here, but it's good. Where uh, you can... People are working around us, which yeah, is good. Exactly. So we're working on air quality and other important environmental <laughs> issues. You were talking about cities. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you can also have low emission zones um, where you can, um, for example, put charges in place so that in order to enter an area, people have to pay a, a charge and yeah. that can significantly reduce the volumes of traffic yeah. or you can be even more radical that huh? so you can take choices about um, investing in public transport in tram trams in metros yeah. in buses in particular electric buses um, and then and you can close off roads and pedestrianize in the center of cities which you know can meet with opposition initially but i yeah. do do think creates much more pleasant um, city spaces for yeah. people to enjoy and can actually boost um, the commercial um, yeah. turnover in yeah. areas where If you think about places where you want to travel for a holiday, for example, you don't want to go to a place where you, there's a you know, standing still traffic and a lot of cars. That's not what you imagine, like a nice urban environment, but also where you live is the same thing. Uh, maybe something a bit uh, less controversial, there's this different technology. So we talked to touch upon electric cars. We had a question about uh, hydrogen uh, powered uh, vehicles, so, so that that can be part of the solution as well. So the combustion engine, really, uh, diesel engines, uh, uh, engines running on petrol, that's where we get the the, uh, the the emissions that impact our health mostly. Uh, yeah, exactly. So um, it's really the internal combustion engine, as you mm -hmm. say, so diesel and petrol um, that lead to air quality emissions. But I would say it's not entirely straightforward to just say let's use electric vehicles um, because electric vehicles, first of all, still emit noise, yeah. um, less at low speeds, but once they get up to a higher speed, the noise is nearly comparable mm -hmm. um, with um, f fossil fuel powered engines. And then there's also these broader questions, right? Like do we really want so much public space in cities to be consumed by what are essential little floating bubbles of private space, yeah. you know, yeah, taking yeah, up yeah. space on the roads? Yeah. We also see more than 40,000 deaths a year from mm -hmm. road transport. Um, and the majority of those deaths are pedestrians yeah. um, or, or cyclists. Yeah. They're not the people in the cars who yeah. die anymore because within the cars, the prote protection is yeah. actually rather good. Yeah. Um, you know, we and, can, and parking as well. And yeah, like the parking, I mean, the yeah. consumption of public space yeah. in cities by vehicles yeah, exactly. is huge. Yeah. And we could talk about changing our city yeah. spaces and making them into much more pleasant, livable and indeed more democratic spaces. Mm. Very good. Um, 
I think we're we're reaching our our time that we set for the interview. If there are more questions uh, from our viewers, then I would suggest you post them now, or then uh, you can always contact us uh, later through our website or on Facebook, and we'll we'll uh, um, get back to you. Um, I was trying to see if there's anything that we haven't covered yet, but uh, I think that's that's pretty complete package. So you mentioned the European Air Quality Index, where you can check the local air quality in real time. We have the uh, uh, the City Air Viewer, where you can ch compare uh, European cities' air quality. Then we have a lot of data. Just generally, we put out data on air quality for for those who are who, who want to crunch their own own numbers, or <laughs> yeah. maybe maybe journalists working on on data. Uh, we work on emissions. Um, we put emissions data out there, which is kind of connected to the air quality issues. Uh, and then there's a lot of other resources about the health impacts, and where you can read read more on our on our website. Um, you mentioned the the improving air quality, and now there's actually an exciting plan or a goal towards um, what's that 2050 the zero pollution pollution action plan and and where we want to be in terms of health impacts maybe maybe we want to sort of finish with that and and, and see where the where the goal would be and, and what that would mean uh, certainly so the European Commission has set a goal that by 2030 mm -hmm. the number of premature deaths um, has fallen by 55% that's on 2005 numbers. Right. Um, so that would be a drop of over 200,000 premature deaths on 2005. We're actually making good progress towards that goal. Yeah. We've seen a reduction so far of 33%. Mm -hmm. So we're more than halfway there. Yeah. So if you draw like a, a, a dotted line towards that target, uh, 2030, it, we're, we're, we're kind of on, on track towards that target. Yeah, we are. Um, but the last part of that transition can be the trickiest, right? Yeah. Because we do start to come up against the... Um, the more kind of locked in practices around agriculture and mobility and yeah. fossil fuels. Um, so we are making good progress. Um, we do see the movement towards the WHO guidelines um, in terms of concentrations of air pollutants as really important mm -hmm. um, as a policy tool taking us towards that goal. Yeah. So we're really excited to see how the review of the air quality directives and indeed the EU um, air quality standards now proceeds over the next two years. Yes, and this is actually one of the topics that is being discussed this week uh, in Madrid. Indeed. Uh, a clean Air Forum. Exactly, yes. And you're going there. I am, yes. And a couple of other colleagues and our executive director, Hans Berunix, will also be speaking there. Yeah. Um, um, can you say as well about, about, about the EU Clean Air Forum? Um, well, who, who's, we have an EEA uh, staff are going there. And then some um, NGOs, uh, the European Commission, uh, representatives from member countries, and they're discussing the type of things that we've just, uh, discussed today and, and, and where to go. Exactly, yes. So there'll be, as you say, representation from across the EU member countries, but also more broadly. Um, the European Commission is organising the event together with the government of Madrid. And essentially, it's a conversation about where are we now with mm -hmm. air quality in Europe and where do we want to go and yeah. how do we get there? Yeah. And what are these key challenges that we need to overcome and how do we mobilise resources, particularly you know, resources that have been made available to governments um, post-corona pandemic? Um, we have these um, huge funds of money that are going to be channeled into investments. And let's make sure those investments deliver clean air. Exactly. Let's uh, end it there. I'll ask our uh, producer to uh, switch off the uh, live broadcast. Uh, thank you, Catherine, for uh, being here today. And uh, thanks for all our viewers. Um, we'll be back with more uh, very soon. Thank you. Thanks.